This week we're going to be taking a look at how to manage the complexity on a project where you have lots of people contributing and you have a source code base that's moving really quickly. And uh, how do you uh, make it possible for lots of people to contribute for the experience of being a developer to be smooth, for people to not make mistakes, for developers to not introduce silly bugs. So there's a lot of things we can do. And I wanna go over a number of tools that are really popular in the way that we manage big open source projects. So a lot of things I'm gonna talk about this week and I want you to experiment with, they are things that you can use on an individual project. So when I'm writing my own source code, I use these tools just because it makes my life so much easier but they are really popular when you're working for a big company or a big project where you need to make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of the way we're gonna write our code. So what we're, what we're really talking about here is we wanna keep the burden of reading and writing the software that we write as low as possible. So that's gonna mean things like adopting common styles that all the developers are gonna use when they write their source code so that we don't have to worry about things like, how do we format our code? Do we put our curly braces on this line or the next line? Do we use semicolons or not? Do we indent with tabs or spaces? Do we use eight spaces? Do we use two spaces? All those kinds of things. So uh, we also wanna reduce the amount of silly bugs, things where you, know, you forget to declare a variable in a language like JavaScript. Um, things that, you know, things that could lead to bugs. So we sometimes call these bad code smells. You know, you, uh, you, you smell that source code and something's not right. Uh, it smells like it's gone off. And, and really that's what we're talking about here is being able to deal with a lot of those kinds of things uh, with tooling. So we wanna, we wanna uh, try and reduce the amount of work that a reviewer or a maintainer on a project has to do when they're trying to understand or write the code. Okay, so think about ways you could do this. So one solution to this problem, and this used to be a really common way that it was dealt with, is that you would write documentation. So you would write a guide and you would say, these are the rules for how we write our code. We do it this way, this way, this way. And when you start at a company or you start on a project, everybody is given this style guide and you have to, uh, you have to make sure that it all gets implemented. The problem is, that people don't tend to read these. Uh, or if they read them, they read and forget them. And so it's very difficult for us to use this as a way to, you know, to maintain a standard. So another thing we could do is we could just set project-wide rules and we could enforce those rules whenever we do reviews. So in order to get your code checked into the project, you need to go through the review process and somebody submits their pull request or submits their code and somebody else who has been in the project a long time looks at it and says, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You need to change change this little thing, this little thing, this little thing. And, uh, and this is how it was often done. For many, many years, this is how uh, big projects did their work. They would encode the rules of a project into the community. So the people, the longstanding members of the community, they knew what the rules were and they just kind of enforced them when uh, people were writing code. Uh, but this doesn't work either because it means that we waste a ton of our time when somebody's trying to get code in, they're trying to fix bugs, add features. You spend just an unbelievable amount of time going over and over and over all of these little paper cuts. And, and so we, we often call these nits. So people would do a review and they would say, nit, you need a space here. You need to put a space after your, your parenthesis here. Silly things like this that, you know, just uh, is a waste of everybody's time. People get frustrated that they have to keep asking. People get frustrated that uh, their code isn't being merged because they haven't met the rules. Um, so what we have really moved toward is a way of enforcing these standards across a project and we do it using tools and automation. So what we're gonna talk about today are some examples of static analysis tools. These are tools that uh, analyze source code versus analyze the running program. So we're gonna be focused this week on uh, analyzing and correcting problems in source code 
And next week we're going to be talking about testing and so on. And there we're going to be looking at trying to deal with errors in the running program. So we have two different sides of this. We have we have sort of static analysis is like compile time and testing is happening at runtime. And you need both of those things. So we're going to do both. But this week we're talking about st static analysis. So these tools play just a huge role in modern software development. And I want to show you how what they are, how to use them, and how to integrate them into your own projects. So once we set up these tools, we can automate them into scripts that we can run. So it's really, you know, one command and I'm able to run all of this suite of tools. But we can also deeply integrate those into our editors or our IDEs so that they are available for the whole project or everybody that's working on them. So then the next layer is enforcing and making sure that these scripts and these tools run every time that anyone makes a request to change the code. So later on, we're going to learn how we integrate the, these things into a continuous integration pipeline. So I have all these static analysis tools and I can run them automatically every time somebody does a pull request. And you've uh, no doubt hit this when you've been submitting uh, pull requests to open source projects and it's come back and said, you failed the build, you need to correct these mistakes in your code. So we'll, you know, we'll come back to this and talk about them as we go. Okay, so let me just talk about some background for a second. So a lot of the tools that we're gonna talk about, they use a concept known as an abstract syntax tree. So I have the Wikipedia page here for abstract syntax tree, and they have a nice little visualization of what the idea of an abstract syntax tree is. So if you think about analyzing source code, the first thing you might think about is, okay, I'm gonna write a whole bunch of regular expressions and I'm gonna have some kind of a program that goes through source code and it searches for certain things, certain patterns, and it reports back on problems that it finds. And there are tools that do this, but uh, most of the tools that you're gonna to use today are much more accurate because they don't operate on the source code. They don't, they don't actually read the text of what you write. Instead, what they do is they use what's called this abstract syntax tree. So what happens is the source code is parsed into a representation where all of the constructs of the program are available in this hierarchical tree structure. So we have, uh, in the example over here on the right, we have a little bit of source code. Uh, we have a little bit of source code on the left, sorry, my monitors are flipped. Uh, on the left over here, we have the source code down here and then we have a representation of what that code looks like in this tree structure and if you want to think about this this is kind of like the difference between html and the dom you know when you have a dom tree and you have this hierarchical structure and it's very easy for computer programs to uh, walk that tree structure and and do things with it so we can use an ast in order to reason about a program to figure out what it does, to analyze it, to spot certain patterns in it, to transform it. So what this allows you to do is take the source code that someone writes, parse it into a tree, and then throw that source code away. We don't even need that source code anymore. We can now use this sort of pure programmatic, represent, programmatic representation of the source code that you've been working on. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna look at ASTs they're useful uh, in a number of contexts. And the first one that I want to talk about is automating code formatting, okay? So I, in the readings this week, I have an analysis that I did, a case study on the Prettier project. And um, let me back up before I go too far talking about Prettier. And I want to talk about the idea of source code beautifiers and this thing called GoFMT, GoFMT, uh, that comes out of the Go language community and the Go tooling. So just about 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, uh, the Go language made a decision to use the, to introduce this tool that automatically formats your code. So it takes Go code and it formats it. And if you look at anybody's Go code, it, it all looks the same. Like all of it looks exactly the same. It's indented the same. It uses the same place to break the lines, same amount of spaces. All Go code reads identically. And it's 
kind of nice because when you go and pick up somebody's code, you can instantly start reading it because it looks familiar. It looks just like the code you would write because everybody uses Go uh, GoFump. So one of the people behind the Go language, Rob Pike, he has a quote and he said that GoFump style is no one's favorite, yet GoFump is everyone's favorite. It's kind of an odd, uh, an odd way to think about it that nobody loves the way that the code looks. Like there's lots of people that would argue about like, should we really indent this far? Should we, should we really use uh, this particular thing, that particular thing? And what happens is people agree that this is good enough. Uh, there's a, you know, in computer science and in computing in general, there's this idea that worse is better, that you could have, you know, trying to find this perfect implementation of anything versus using um, what works. And so in this case, this has really worked. It's worked really well. And one of the advantages is that everybody who reads the code, any Go program knows what's going on. So this is kind of an interesting concept and it has influenced all kinds of other languages. And in the last few years, it's become incredibly popular to use standard formatting on source code. I don't know, it, it was resisted for a long time. I think partly because the tools weren't good enough to do it. And so you would have um, cases that would break. It's really hard to write a program that does this well. And uh, in, the, in the readings for this week, you can read about um, James and uh, others talking about um, how hard it was to write this and what they had to do at Facebook in order to make it work. But now that we have tools that can do this, AST-based tools that can actually do this correctly, it's been incredibly freeing to be able to do this. So a couple of things, this is James Long who uh, originally started the project and he's got a video here you can watch, a little uh, a talk he gave on why he built this, but he has a number of things to say. So he says, the problem that he was trying to solve with Prettier, Prettier is like GoFumped, but it's for JavaScript and the web, was that having different styles makes it hard to work on a team. If you and I are working on a program together and you write your code this way and I write my code this way, every time either of us looks at, a, at the, the source code, we're gonna have to do a little bit more work to try and figure out what's going on. I can't just read it quickly. It's like if you were reading a novel and every chapter used a different font and changed the way the pages looked and everything. I mean, it's kind of novel, it's interesting, but it's not helpful to the task of reading. So if you wanna make reading really easy, what you're gonna do is you're gonna reduce the differences as much as possible. So what we're gonna do here is we're not gonna be creative with the way we write our code. <laughs> be creative with what your code does, but don't be creative with the style of this. This, this isn't an E.E. E. Cummings poem. We're not trying to write something that you know is really fancy on the page. You're trying to make sure that people can quickly understand it. So like a lot of people, James was influenced by GoFump uh, and the success that, that uh, Google had had with the Go language. And also he was looking to try and get rid of the problem that I just talked about a minute ago, which is you send a PR up for review and it takes many, 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 many iterations before they will accept it because you need a space here, you need a space here, you need to indent this, you need to unindent this, etc. So trying to get rid of all of those problems. So he says that some of the interesting things that automatic source code formatting does for you, number one, it produces this consistency across a code base. We've already talked about that. The second thing is that it introduces what he calls teachability. So Prettier can tell you things about your code. So it's really interesting when you have an automatic source code formatter, like what Prettier really does is it takes your code and you input code in one form, it parses it into an AST, throws away the original source code, and then takes the AST and prints it. So it pretty prints it again. I'll just show you what it looks like here. So this is uh, the online version of Prettier where you can come and you can try it out. So here on the left, I've got uh, this program and I can write whatever I want over here. And you'll notice that it's not affecting anything that I do over here on the right. Um, if I were to put a console.log hello world, here, you can see that over here, it has fixed the formatting for me. So if I wrote my code like this, and I've seen lots of situations, you know, where students uh, aren't used to indenting their code, and their code looks like this, and you can see that 
it's taken the code that I've written and it has automatically reformatted it to look like this. So no matter what I give it, it's going to give me back code that is standardized. That's always going to be going to be correct. And you'll see that it will fix certain things for me. So like, for example, um, if I wrap null in parenthesis, the AST knows that that's not necessary, so it removes it. Or if I was needing to uh, use insert parenthesis, sometimes it'll insert it for you. You'll notice that here, if I get rid of the semicolon, it puts a semicolon in for me because JavaScript requires semicolons or JavaScript's going to insert these semicolons for you. And so you get around uh, various bugs like in JavaScript, if I were to write, um, uh, something like this, this is a common bug, um, name equals bug. So here's the code that I wrote here, and here's the code that it returned. And you'll notice that what's happened is it's put a semicolon right there. So there's this teachability moment where you might not know that in JavaScript, if you don't put this brace on the same line as your return, it's going to automatically insert a semicolon and you're gonna return undefined. So there's like this weird bug that can happen and you don't realize it, but the automatic, the automatic co code formatting shows you that you have a bug. So that, that is very interesting. The final thing he says is that you have freedom to not be constrained or bother thinking about the structure of your code. You can just write code. So in the video, he talks about the fact that when you're trying to get a tricky piece of code to work and you're copying and pasting things from different places and you're very quickly hacking code together, what I don't want to do is I don't want to worry about having it be all perfectly aligned. Like if I'm refactoring my code and instead of using it in a function, I'm going to put it into a method of an object and the code needs to look totally differently because the indents are all differently, all differently done. I don't want to spend a ton of time on that. I want to think through the logic of what I'm trying to build and I want my tool to just go back and fix it for me so I can paste my code in, it looks like a mess, I test it out, it works, I save it, boom, it's formatted, everything looks great. So um, I'll, I'll encourage you to go through and look at the interview that I did. Uh, uh, Christopher Shadow, one of the main people behind this along with James, I interviewed him and he talked a lot about how this program came about. And he actually talks about, uh, one of the first things he told me was how he was influenced by being a student. When he was like you and he was a student, his professors used to deduct marks every time they made a formatting error and it just drove him crazy. Like probably it's driven you crazy before too. And so he was like, I want to solve this problem. And so uh, being a student and having somebody tell you your code is wrong, your code is wrong and wanting to once and for all solve this and Prettier, I mean, he has solved it. Prettier is amazing because it's now used across like all of Facebook uses it. It's used for like so many web projects. It's kind of the standard, a lot, a lot like GoFunct. Um, here you've got this other standard of, you know, using Prettier to be able to do this. Okay, so that's the first one that I wanted to talk about is using abstract syntax trees to do code formatting. And there's tons of different code formatters. So I've been talking about Prettier and Go, but you can get them for Java, for C, for C++, for all these different projects. Um, and it just makes everybody's life easier because there's no more arguments about what our style is going to be. Our style just is whatever the tool produces. Okay, the next one that I wanted to talk about is, I wanted to talk about linting. So if, if, if I talk about lint in, uh, you know, it's typical uh, meaning in English, uh, lint is, you know, this stuff on your shirt, the, the fluff that you get, the, the stuff that gets caught in your dryer, it's all the accumulated unwanted fibers on your clothing after you go through the laundry or uh, things that are on your jacket. And, you, and it's, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it's the kind of thing that you, it doesn't look good. You, you know, it doesn't look very cleaned up. So in software, we have this same idea. We have this idea of lint and it comes from the Unix world, from the C programming world. So way back in 1978, the lint command was uh, you know, was was 
was made uh, part of you know for C and Unix programming. And since then, linters, there's all kinds of different linters. So when we talk about a linter, we mean not a compiler, but we need we mean a program that takes another program's source code and it scans it, it analyzes it for uh, suspicious constructs, things that you know again have a bad code smell. It looks for stylistic errors. Um, things that could lead to weird bugs. Like for example, in, in this case over here, if I move this return statement down and you see that it puts the semicolon in here, like this is a bug, this is a bug that the author probably doesn't intend. They don't intend, what you're really doing here is you're really returning undefined. But that's probably not what they think they're doing. What they think they're doing is that they're returning this object, but that's not happening. So you need a tool that can spot that because I can type that code. There's nothing stopping me from typing that code out, but I don't want that code to actually execute or stay in my program. So I need something that can, can find that for me. So lint, there's all kinds of things that are, um, you know, problems in lint, things like undeclared variables in a language like JavaScript or defining um, arguments multiple times or um, using certain kinds of white space. Like um, I had a student come to me um, last week or a couple weeks ago and he had, a, he had a program that wouldn't work and he couldn't figure it out. Like it, it, it was just crashing the JavaScript parser and the problem was that he had a zero width space in his program. So he had a Unicode character that was a space that was like, it had no width. So you couldn't see it. Like it's like the worst kind of bug. He had copy pasted some code from a website and the website had inserted these zero width spaces to make it hard to copy and paste it. So basically it breaks the code. And so he couldn't, because he couldn't see it, like you could look at the code and not see it, but it would say, I can't parse this line. It was really frustrating for him. Well, I've dealt with this kind of stuff before, so I knew what to look for. Um, and what you really need is you need someone that doesn't have decades of experience looking at your code. You need a tool that you can give a piece of code to, and it says, this code is not allowed. Like it'd be interesting to see if I copied this, um, this character, um, I wonder if they let me copy it easily. Let me see if I can do this. Um, that's an image. Shoot, I'd love to just... Yeah. Zero, <clears throat> excuse me, zero width space example. Okay, here we go. Let's try this. If I paste this in here, uh, right here. Okay, that's perfect. So there's a character here that can't be printed, but ESLint is printing it. It sees it and you'll see that I get a parsing error, unexpected character on line four at position 18. So you have, you have a tool that can, can see the unseeable, a tool that can uh, sense when something is gonna, gonna go wrong. So if you take a look at, I found a little piece of JavaScript on the web and I pasted it in here and you can see that I'm getting a whole bunch of linting errors on it. So the first one is, it says require is not defined, require is not defined. Up here, I'm using require, but require hasn't been defined. So for example, I could say that this uh, require is a global that is being uh, defined somewhere else, as an example. And now those errors go away. So I'm communicating in my source code and saying, this is this is to be expected, don't worry about this one. And I come down here and it says, um, geometry is assigned a value but never used. So this is an interesting, an interesting bug because there's nothing wrong with this code, like it works. But the point is I am 
I'm using this, but I don't need it because nowhere in my code is it being used. So actually, I could delete it. So if I delete this, then the next thing that happens, it says three is assigned a value but never used. Well, actually, I could delete this too because it's not being used anywhere. So what ESLint is helping you do is it's helping you spot things like you don't need this, this has never been defined. Are you sure you need to define this somewhere else before you use it? What's going on here? So here's another one. It says on line seven, right here, this is not allowed before super. So this is an interesting bug. I am, um, I should be calling my base constructor before I start doing things on the current instance. So this is a bug where I need to move this line right here. And so now that one goes away. And now down at the bottom here, it says module is not defined. So module is another global. And now it says my code is lint free. So this is great. I have more confidence in this code now because I have a tool that's been able to look at the code, go through it and um, make sure that it is lint free, okay? So when you're looking for linters, they go by all different names. If you're in Python, there's different set of linters than if you're in C++, than if you're in JavaScript, etc. So lint is a, is a family of static analysis tools that runs on source code to do the sort of things that we're talking about. So there's two more things that I want to mention, and then I want to show you how we do this stuff in Telescope. So the next thing is, that all of the tools that I've talked to you about right now can be run as command line tools. And a lot of you, I know that some of you are, are getting used to the idea of doing things on the command line. And I push a lot of you to do things on the command line because, um, well, there's one of the reasons that, we, that command line based tools are so useful is that we can automate them. We can write scripts, we can run them inside, we can write programs that run those programs for us, which is really gonna be helpful in a couple of weeks when we start doing continuous integration. However, you don't always want to have to do everything on uh, the command line. And so what's nice is integrating these tools directly into your editor. So if you're using an IDE or an editor, you're using Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code or some other editor, be aware that all of those tools are going to have plugins uh, or add-ons that are going to allow you to integrate these tools directly into your editor so that as you're typing, you can get immediate feedback, just like you would if you were writing an email or in a word processor, where you get immediate feedback on spelling mistakes and things like that. The last thing that I'll mention now, and then I'm going to show you an example of it, is that Git provides a way for us to do some of these things during the workflow of using Git. So it has a concept called Git hooks. A hook is a concept, when you, when you hear people talk about hooks, what they really mean is, they mean it's a function. It's like something you could hang something on. Like if you think about, if I came into your house and you had a hook on the wall, I could hang my coat on it, I could, someone could put their purse on it, you could hang a bag on it, whatever. The hook is there and it's available to take something. So in our case, what we wanna be able to do is we wanna be able to give a script or some piece of code that can be executed when something happens. So in the case of Git, there's a whole bunch of, of hooks and in the readings this week, I have them listed that allow you to do things like um, every time I'm going to commit my code, just before I commit that code, run a program on it. So I've added files to the staging area and now I want to format those files, for example, so that before they go into Git, everything is automatically formatted. Okay, so let me switch uh, my view here and let me take you through what we do inside uh, Telescope. Okay, so inside the Telescope project, I wanna walk you through uh, what we do in order to make things easier for our developers. So the first thing I want you to notice is that we have a directory called .vs code. And if you're working on VS code, there are, it's similar for all IDEs, but the idea is that I'm going to put some configuration files into my source code project into Git 
And everybody who works on this repo is automatically going to have access to these settings. So the first one that we have here is in VS Code, you can specify a set of extensions that you'd like developers to use so that when they're developing your project, for example, you can see that in Telescope, we have the ESLint and we have the prettier extensions added to the list of extensions that we want to be installed. So that when you start up, if you're developing Telescope and you open up the project, it will recommend that there are extensions that you can install in your, in your project and it will automatically do some of these things for you. Another thing that we do is we specify settings for the editor. So for example, we specify the number of spaces that we want and so on. But the most important thing that we do are these two, th these two lines right here. So we say that every time that the user saves a file, we want to format the code using the prettier extension. And so that's gonna mean that when people are working on their code, all they have to do is save it and it'll automatically reformat everything for them. And it's just so, so nice to have that directly integrated into, uh, into our tooling. Okay, the next thing that we do is we use ESLint. And so like a lot of these programs, what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to set up a config file or in um, Unix speak, these were called run control files. So often you'll see things with an RC at the end. So here, um, eslint rc.js has all of the rules that we specify for how we wanna configure eslint. So for example, we, are extending a number of um, ESLint configurations that exist on the web. We use the Airbnb style guide. So Airbnb has a set of ESLint rules that they use on all of their code, and we have adopted that. We've also brought in things like React recommendations because we're doing React, things for working with promises because we have a lot of promise-based code. We're using React hooks, so we pull in that. So there's lots of these plugins for the linting system that let you essentially pull in rules. Like the way that ESLint works is there are just tons and tons, all linters are like this, but they have lots and lots of rules for all different things that you can check. And by default, not everything is turned on. So you may, for example, um, you might want to limit the maximum number of lines in a file. Well, we don't, but you might want to, or you might want to enforce the maximum length of a file. So these are rules that you could turn on if you wanted to. And what we do here is we have certain rules that we have overridden or rules that we want to add that weren't part of the ones that are above. And so that's what's happening here. So what this is going to mean is that ESLint is going to complain about certain things as you're writing your code or when you run the, the various scripts and it's gonna tell you you need to fix this, you need to fix that, and this is where we configure all of, the, all of those pieces. Okay, the next thing that we have is we have a prettier RC file. So again, it's a configuration file for prettier and it specifies the settings that we want prettier to use. So for our code base, we wanna have two uh, spaces we wanna have semicolons, we wanna use Unix line endings, we wanna use single quotes, we want every line to be maximum 100 characters wide, etc. So you specify all of the ways that you want Prettier to work on your code. Some source code formatters are highly configurable and others are highly opinionated and they don't give you much choice. We have one other file here and this is a prettier ignore file and what it does is it works like a git ignore file it gives you a list of files and folders that should be ignored when we format our code so for example we don't want to reformat any of the code that's in the node modules folder because that is not code that we are writing it's code that we're using similarly we don't want to um, reformat the built artifacts so uh, we don't want to, things that we produce, we don't want to reformat that. So there's a bunch of cache folders, public folders, etc., that we want to eliminate from that list. So a lot of times when you're configuring these files, linting files, config, they'll have the ability for you to set up an ignore file or some way to ignore certain paths or patterns. So pay attention to that because you don't want to have your tool 
formatting or checking or linting things that you don't actually uh, have as part of your as part of your program. Okay, the next thing, because we're doing a node project here, in our package.json file, we have a bunch of scripts, and you can see all of the scripts are here. And I'll just mention a few of them that are you know, related to what I've been talking to you right now. So the first one is we have an ESLint script. And what it does is it runs ESLint on all of our code. And um, we have a second one called ESLint fix. ESLint fix will try to fix any of the um, any of the errors that it finds that are fixable. So for example, if you're missing a semicolon, it can just go and add the semicolon. Or if you used two equal signs instead of three equal signs in JavaScript, it can fix that for you. So those are the kinds of things that we will use and we can do npm run eslint or npm run eslint fix. We also have a um, an eslint script so that, it, or, sorry, we have an eslint script and a lint script and what the lint script does is it just runs eslint. And we do that because then you don't have to remember if you're running lint or eslint, they both work. So it's just a thing for developers not to have to worry about this so much. We have a script for running Prettier. And so we tell Prettier to work on all of our Markdown, JSX, JSON, HTML, CSS, all these different files. And we pass it the right flag so that it will overwrite the files that are there. And we also have this one, this um, similar uh, script called Prettier Check. We do this because we found that people would not install the right dependencies, and then they would submit a pull request, and we needed a way to make sure that the code had been formatted properly. So Prettier allows you to check that the source code is formatted correctly, and if it isn't, it reports an error, or you can tell it to just automatically rewrite the source code. So we do both things. We have both ways of, um, of working with this. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about is this one here is, is Husky. And in Node Projects, one of the tools we can use, one of the NPM modules we can use is called Husky. And what it lets us do is it lets us install npm commands to run as git hooks. So I told you that git has various hooks like pre-commit hooks. And what we're doing here is we're running a step. So every time somebody is going to commit their code, it's going to run prettier on top of any of the code that's in the staging area. So that means that when somebody is writing their code, let's say they're not using Visual Studio Code and they don't have the extensions installed and they haven't properly formatted their code. Well, what's gonna happen is this hook is going to automatically reformat their code for them so that they don't have to, to do it. So if they don't know to do it, the tools will hopefully catch it for them. And this is gonna happen in a platform agnostic way. So if you're on Windows, it's gonna work. If you're on Mac or Linux, it's gonna work. It doesn't matter, the scripts will work in all cases. So that's how we do, that's how we do things uh, in Telescope. And what you're gonna be doing in your, uh, your lab this week is you're gonna be taking your link checker project and you're gonna be adding a linter you're gonna be adding a source code formatter and you're gonna be setting up configuration files for your editor or IDE so that it all is automatically gonna work um, for anyone who contributes to your project. I want you to get some experience with this because once you get comfortable doing this kind of setup, when you're doing a project, when you're working with your friends on something, if you're doing a systems project um, you know, in the courses here, or you're working at a company or a startup, you're gonna run into this where you need to standardize on these tools, standardize on the approaches, and you're gonna not want to have to invent ways of doing it. You're gonna wanna just reach for a bunch of tools, integrate them into your project, and automatically have all of that work. So I wanna give you that experience this week and um, when you're done, it'll, it'll change your life. <laughs> when you're done, I think you'll be a believer.